Aloha, everyone, and welcome to the Hawaii Abroad Audio Podcast. I'm your host, Auntie Max, and my intention is to share the stories of Native Hawaiians, also known as Kanaka Maoli, that relocated away from our homeland in Hawaii. In this episode, I'm speaking to Sarah Kamano. She's an island girl originally from Kailua, Oahu, and reside in several states, such as New York, Illinois, Massachusetts, California, and other locations. She's a Punahou High School alumnus, an artist, a strong Hawaiian activist as a protector of the land in Hawaii. Sarah shares with us her journey of living abroad for many years, then returning to Hawaii to reside back in her homeland. Aloha, Sarah, and thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Ano aiki vilina aloha e. Aloha. So um, I'll be asking you a few questions, and first of all, thank you so much for being here. And before I really get into my questions, I was wondering if you can just share with us a little bit about your journey. And I know Sarah's interview is a little different because. My kai that she was able to return back home, so locating back home. But I did want to talk sorry with you about your journey when you did leave Hawaii, how long you was there, um, the journey that you went on. So can you just share with us a little bit about your journey when you left Hawaii and then relocated back home? So, <clears throat> um, in I believe it was two thousand three, two thousand three, um. I was doing pretty well here. I was working on the Hawaiian language newspaper project and uh, I was writing for the Honolulu Weekly and I was getting kind of a lot of, a fair amount of recognition as a performance poet. So a poem that I wrote about American imperialism in Hawaii was being presented at the Four Seas Conference, which is a, it's an academic conference about teachers developing curriculum at the collegiate level. So I was asked to come and read at the conference in New York City. And I had a, few friends out there that were living there that I had known from Hawaii and I just kind of like fell in with this artist community in this loft building in Brooklyn and I just decided you know things were there is a lot of like drug addiction in my family and you know I just was in a in the family I was like very unhappy so I just went and chanced them <laughs> and I moved to New York City and um, I was there for three years. And then um, when my Korean grandmother passed away, I ended up coming back and getting married. And then I stayed. Um, my grandmother really was insistent that I come and live with her. So I lived with them for a number of years. And then eventually I went back. I had intended to go back and move back to Brooklyn but we ended up li living in DC <clears throat> and we lived in Richmond. And then I came back in 2013 and then I went back to the mainland again. I lived in San Francisco for the past five years. So I've been kind of going back and forth all of my adult life. Yeah, yeah. So um, I was wondering, I know I asked a lot of the, my interviewees the same, the same question is while you're in the mainland, while you're living abroad, um, is there any culture practices that you do? Why were you able to do while you was gone or traditions that you was able to practice? Well, <clears throat> I was raised you know, my family is really, really traditional. My grandfather is uh, um, the grandfather, the grandson of Kapohiva. He was like a really um, famous kahuna laolapao. So nice. pretty much like everything, you know, in our lives is about maintaining, like we practice aikapu, we don't eat with men and stuff, but because I, you know, I, I had done my undergraduate degree in Hawaiian studies and I was, um, I finished like six credits away from a BA in Hawaiian language. So I was pretty much fluent. So maintaining your fluency in, on the continent is really difficult. So one of the things that um, I consistently did to help me maintain my fluency in Alila Hawaii is 
like listening to these songs in Hawaiian, like um, <clears throat> like Kahawanu Lake Trio and old Genoa songs and transcribing them and then translating them because you know you have no one to talk to and it can be a really alienating experience. So music, you know, maintaining a connection with Hawaiian music is something that helped me to not <clears throat> be totally depressed all the time <laughs> and it also helps me to you know maintain my fluency in in the language nice. so let's say that's the ma main cultural practice that i was you know doing while i was out there so how about um things that you so how was it being a kanaka living abroad i mean can you share a little bit about the comparisons between what you was doing there compared to how things that would be happening here in Hawaii? Do you have any kind of comparison about living abroad? Oh, it was crazy. I mean, when I moved to New York, my younger sister moved to San Francisco. And at a certain point she was, when our, when our grandmother passed away, she decided that she was gonna come home and she came and visited with me in New York City. And I said, you know, you're doing well in San Francisco and I'm doing well in New York. Why are you going home? She said, I'm leaving the mainland, Sarah, because these people, it's like, they don't know who I am. And she was like, you don't belong out here. I mean, it was an incredible, New York City is like so different. It's like, it was an insane culture shock. And when I moved to New York City, I only knew like two other Hawaiians, Kimo Gerard, the house manager of Carnegie Hall and Brent Berger, who's like a, the famous painter who lived in Red Hook and they're much, much older than me. But like now there's a lot like the, almost like the entire Kalahiki family has relocated to New York City because of Lane. And, you know, there's, there's all kinds of Hawaiians but it was incredibly alienating. And just people are so different. The way that people behave is so different. I had to change. Like when I came home, my mom was like, this is not you. I didn't raise you like this. And I said to her, I said, you know, I had to drop that nice, nice Hawaiian girl thing because if you can't sell somebody in New York City, you know, you're wasting my time and just walk away. Those people just walk all over you and they'll take everything you have, you know? And I said, you know, if I hadn't changed, mom, my friends maybe would have called you like, oh, they found your daughter's body on the side of the Long Island Expressway, you know? Ooh, so wow. being like, being, local people are, really nice to each other and there's it's almost like a thing where they think that they they feel like they have to engage with any little thing that comes their way and so because I spent so much time in the city it like altered me it altered my personality because you know you have to ad adapt to survive culturally and so now when I come home people are like well you are so rude <laughs> you know and I'm like yeah that's that New York stuff you know and <clears throat> I think that one of the things that, because so many people have, you know, entered the diaspora in our generation. And now, as I'm sure you know, there are more Hawaiians living outside of Hawaii than there are here in our homeland. And so it's, it's become a part of our cultural identity about indigenous people that we've been, you know, pretty much displaced. And in a similar fashion to like, there, like there's a huge Palestinian community in New York City, like these people cannot go home. Like people who, from, who are from Gaza, they can't go home. There's nothing to go back to, you know? And it, there is a corollary in the Hawaiian and the job market and the housing market are, in, <clears throat> are so like out of whack and so hard to survive here, you know? And on the mainland, I was just talking to my friend Royce Polalu about this. I said, you know, it's a thing where you, like people are so, um, just holes out there <laughs> compared to how we were raised. And it, it's like it, it, the, the divorce as indigenous people, the like divorcement from our homeland is a form of cultural genocide. And I was telling Royce, I said, it's like, cause he, he had to move to Tennessee. And I said, how can you stand it? You know, I, I was like, I know you want to need to have this experience and stuff, but the bottom line is it like it eats away at you a little bit every day you know and it's heartbreaking because we're we're not just you know we're indigenous people and being connected to our homelands to our aina is critical for us it's critical for our emotional health you know so that's like i think that to me you know as as a scholar and activist you know that's 
one of the things that is, it's a, I mean, it's not just a challenge that we're facing as a people now. It's like, it's a transformative process where we're changing culturally because so many of us have been forced to relocate and to be away from our homeland, you know? Yes, yes, exactly. Um, so since you went there about, um, you know, people moving away so little bit amount of Hawaiians living in Hawaii. Um, I want to share some statistics that I was, that I did um, on research. And using the US consensus report, and they do that every 10 years, yeah, so they just did it re recently in 2020. So based on some of that recent research on this topic, the Native Hawaiian population in Hawaii has decreased tremendously. Native Hawaiians seem to be migrating away from our homeland in Hawaii, unfortunately. So when we look at the numbers right now um, in the state of Hawaii, the overall amount of people in Hawaii right now is about a million, a million and a half. But when you look at just that amount of people that is actually Hawaiian and they group it with Pacific Islanders, Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, it's only 11%, and that's with Hawaiians with the Pacific Islanders. There's only 11% of us in Hawaii, residing in Hawaii right now. And that's, to me, that's astounding. Your thoughts on that? I think that um, the economy is tourism-based, so, and it's a militarist complex, right? So people come out here in the military, people come out here as tourists, they market Hawaii, they market our our homelands, you know, globally. I was in Palestine and people are like, oh, Hawaii, we'd like to have a vacation there. You know, everybody in the world, everywhere I've been, and I've been all over the world, everybody knows about Hawaii. So it's like those who can move here will and do. And our standard of public education is like second in lowness to, I believe it's like Mississippi. So when you grow up here and you attend, you know, I, I was very privileged and I attended Punahou, but even me, it's like, I'm in New York City and people are like, oh, you have an art degree. And I'm like, yeah, I do. And they're like, where, from where do you go to school? I said, I, like University of Hawaii in Manoa. And the person just laughs in my face because they went to Yale and I can't compete with that, you know? So people like come here and they have a far, they're way better educated and how are we supposed to compete in the job market with them? That's, you know, just stacking the odds, right? And you look at the housing market. It's like, I'm looking at these rentals. I'm like, I may as well just move back to New York. It's the same. It's so just like living in, it's like living in Manhattan. You know, you're paying $1,900 for a shoebox. And <clears throat> I honestly feel as, you know, a scholar and a part-time activist, like that, these people, these outsiders did this so that they could come in here and take all our land and bring nuclear weapons up in here, which is what they've done, you know? And they've made it impossible for the average local person, not just Hawaiians, but local people who grew up here too, to, to even survive in this economy, people working three jobs, you know, it's, that's impossible. You can't make ends meet that way. And so nobody, it's like with Micronesians. I was teaching in Micronesia, you get on the plane, everybody is crying their eyes out. Those people are not trying to leave Micronesia, but you can't make it over there. You can't get a job, you can't get milk, you can't get anything, you know? And it's the same thing here. You're paying like $6 for a pint of cherry tomatoes. You know what I mean? Like, wow, these people that took over our country are doing it to us on purpose there so that you know it's like they were like okay they're just all going to die out you know but it didn't happen and we're like okay we're still here and it's like okay well, we're going to just push you out you know that's my local cool that's what i'm seeing happen yeah i totally hear what you're saying i totally hear what you're saying because when you look at the numbers on our local you know kanaka where are they they're not in hawaii unfortunately they're being pushed out because we just can't make it here. The, the economy is- ridiculous. In Hawaii, in Hawaii, our people are living at the bottom of society. And you know, when I was doing my Hawaiian studies degree, I was very close with Hanani Trash. And she's, she would always say, you know, Hawaiians are living at the bottom of society. They're, they're living, you know, just in total poverty. All of our men are in jail. 
you know, like 98% prison population, and we're only like 20% of the actual population, but we're just, we're just like crime committers, or is it a systematic situ a sy situation of systematic colonial oppression? That's not just Hawaii. That's all over the world. It's, a sy it's systemic colonial oppression, and it's genocide. Yes, you got a good point there. Yes, it is worldwide, and it's unfortunate that such a beautiful place like Hawaii has to be dealing with that type of issues. Well, um, I want to thank you for, for being such an activist for our people. I mean, we need that. We need to get our voices out there and tell them straight sometimes, you know? Because <laughs> you're right, like you were saying earlier, us Hawaiians, we're very humble, we're very soft and nice to people, but sometimes we need those activists like like Hanani and like you. So thank you, thank you so much. But I kind of wanted to redirect the conversation now and maybe try and um, share a little bit about some fond memories you might've had just growing up in Hawaii. Oh God, I'm gonna, yeah. So I had written, you know, Hanani, she really, because she was a poet, she really pushed me to, you know, write poetry and, you know, there's no money in poetry. And I, I don't think I, I ever would have become a poet like that if it wasn't for it. Like she, she kind of like manipulated me into it. But I wrote this poem about, you know, my grandparents, they used to live in this place, we call it Marigold or some people call it down the road. And this was like, I mean, <clears throat> like it was condemned, you know, where like your, your friends refused to go down there. I'd come with my friends from Kailua. They're like, your family doesn't live here. I'm like, yeah, we do live here, man. We do. <laughs> you know, it was just like the crappiest like I mean it you know you like fall through the floor and <laughs> you're just like a bucket under the sink like barely got running water and whatnot it, you know you'd rock down at night pit bulls jumping out and attacking you just all broken cars and about how like it didn't matter how trashy it was because we were all together as a family and and you know because he was a he was like a master planter and an outdoorsman, right? And um, he would go up in the mountains every year and get a pig and like emu this pig. And there, you know, there was this, there's this other property that my granny Kiki Avila established in Chun's Lane in Haleiwa. And like all the kids in the lane would, we'd be just like all riding around on our bikes and going to Chen's store and Royce Polalu had sent me this picture and it's like 30 kids. And I said to my mom, I said, how do you guys manage that many kids? She said, oh, we didn't, <laughs> you know, you just like no adult supervision. <laughs> We're like getting hurt, bleeding and you know what I mean? Now in Chen's lane, it's like, Holly's have come in here and built these ostentatious houses right up on the property line. And the life here and there's like vacation rentals and the life here is so different, you know, and there's strangers, you know, back in the day, like everybody in China, it was like Kamara's and then my auntie Steffi de Freitas, his house was right next door and my auntie Noma Kamara and my auntie Vicky and like everybody in this lane was related and the Polos, everybody was related. And now it's like, and if, you know, if we saw an unfamiliar car, we'd be like, what in the hell? <laughs> who got lost you know and now there's just like all these strangers just crawling all over you know like <clears throat> the lane that of my parents house in Kailua in my generation and prospectors have come in and built huge houses like I one of our properties in Kailua on Inoni Street where we grew up with the Hui Hui's and the Kalahikis I turned down there the other day I thought I had made a wrong turn I didn't recognize anything and I was born in that house like in the house I was born and I couldn't even recognize it. I, I, I was just like disoriented. I literally, and the mess of things, I was born and raised there in Kailua, you know? And my, my grandmother bought her land there in the forties when nobody wanted to live there. And like the fact that I couldn't even recognize Ku Onehano, the, my birthplace is just insane. It's so heartbreaking, you know? Like that life that we lived is so precious and it's gone now. My, my auntie Lilia, you know, she, she was the daughter of Victoria Hokano, who was a, um, they, they came off of Hamakua Poco Plantation, but they're actually from Kaupo and Kipahulu. They're Kua Hivalanis. And like, she got with this military guy and she ended up, you know, in Oregon and she would come and visit. And I said to her at one point, I said, 
Auntie, why don't you just come home? Don't you miss Hawaii? And she said, I would, but the Hawaii I miss, it doesn't exist anymore. You know? So I think that's one of the things that is happening to our people that are in the diaspora for so many years. You come home and it's like, you don't even recognize home anymore because these outsiders have altered it to the point where it's a similar, to me, it's similar to the way in which like, you know, people ask me all the time because I'm, people ask me all the time, like, why are you so intense about the Mo'okuo how It's so tedious and like, you know, cause my main stuff is like art and, you know, I'm a published poet and whatever. <clears throat> but the reason I'm so intense about the genealogy is because, you know, they say Makainan are, are, at one point, everybody was a Lee. Makainan are people that wandered into the Kuahivi and forgot who they are. And so you don't even know that you're talking to your cousin right now, you know? And in a similar fashion, it's like, when we forget who we are, we forget our names, we forget our genealogy, right? We become so out of touch with our mana and that other people can come in here and just crush us. And in the same fashion, when we come home and we can't even remember where we're from, we can't even recognize it anymore. That's just a way of just screwing us down emotionally and in life, you know, so that these people can walk all over us. Yeah, just things have changed so rapidly, our generation, right? And it's like this transformation that we're going through like, this is why I wanted to participate in this podcast of yours, because it's critical for this to be documented, because people in the future are going to be looking back and going like, how did this happen to us? You know, that it's happening right now. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's so unfortunate. But so I thank you for participating with with me in this process. Um, I think I, I wanted to ask you before we end. Um, I know we've been talking a lot about Hawaii and what's been happening and so on. Now that you're back in Hawaii, um, do you have a message that you want to share with the Kanaka about living abroad, moving away, if they feel like they they need to leave because of the economy or whatever reason? Um, do you have a message for them? First of all, I don't believe <clears throat> that any Hawaiian actually wants to live on the bullshit filled mainland. <laughs> I agree. But, you know, people, leave, people leave for various reasons and most are economic. And, you know, food may be cheaper out there and housing may be cheaper and whatever's whatever. But I truly believe as an activist and as, you know, as a somebody who comes from a, a chiefly family that like our Aina is continuously calling us home. Our land is our ancestor place. And our ancestors are calling us as an activist to all Hawaiians in diaspora is that, you know, home is harsh. Home is hard. It's full of heartbreak. It's full of poverty. But this is our homeland. And we need to be present here or these people are going to wipe us off the face of the earth. And that's exactly what they're trying to do you know, and it's really hard to make it out here and happening to our people. And it crushes me emotionally. But I know, you know, I thought I could flop around in New York and have my own life and make it as an artist and whatever. And I, you know, I did well. I had work in a gallery in Soho and that was great, but it will never, ever replace what it means for me as a Hawaiian to be connected to my homeland. I told my, my mom's in Vegas and I said to her, the moment I, I started planting this garden at my place in Kailua, and I said, the moment I put my hands in the, in, the, or in the soil, I realized this is what was wrong with me the whole time in San Francisco. This is what was wrong with me the whole time in New York. You know, it is impossible for indigenous people to have, a, to have as, an, as somebody who was raised in La Alapa'o, one of the things we understand is that it's impossible for us to, as indigenous people, particularly as Hawaiians, to have true emotional and psychological health and even physical health because the two are interconnected if we are not in touch with our homeland. It is the most critical thing for us as Hawaiians. Aina, Aina is survival. Aina is everything to us. And when we're cut off from that, we're cut off from our ancestors, we're cut off from who we ourselves are. And if we wanna get out of this situation, we're gonna have to suck it up and maintain a presence here. But these people are going to just edge us out 
until we're not even us anymore. Very good advice. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm so glad yeah, that you participated and you're sharing with us about, you know, your journey. Sorry. First of all, I, I want to commend you um, because, you know, just like our navigators in history, they had to navigate a way to look for a new world for their family and, you know, look for a way to take care of their family. You was able to be brave enough to do that. And, but because knowing on what's happening in Hawaii and yeah. how hard it is to live back in Hawaii, you were even more brave to come back and to just suck it up, like you said, and just keep your aina, yeah? Stand up for your aina and we need people like you. So thank you so much. Thank you for advocating for Hawaii. Thank you for saying that. I, I, it is, you know, I like, because I went to Punahou, like all of my friends, they go to like these mainland colleges and then they're like, they graduate high school and they're like, now it's my life that I can do whatever I want. And I thought I could do that. But, you know, my grandmother put a kuleana on me and she said, you know, you're going to have to represent me in this family when I'm gone. And I was like, what? Like I, I made it in New York myself. I didn't ask you for a red cent. You can't do that to me. And she said, no, Sarah, I can do that to you because we made you and people suffered and struggled on plantations so that you could have privilege. And you, I'm gonna tell you what to do and you're gonna do it, girl. You know, and it was really hard to take because I was like in my thirties when we had this conversation, but the bottom line is my gifts are not for me. My privilege, you know, I had a lot of privilege and I didn't deserve it any more than any of my cousins and any of the rest of you. So my gifts are for our people, you know? Well and said. as elite, we don't have that attitude, you know, we don't deserve to be elite. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's about the people and about the ohana, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. My ka'i. It's Mahalo. hard. You know what I mean? It's hard. Like, I want to I wanna be like my Holly friends at Punahou and just, like, be like, oh, it's just my life. But you know what? It's really not my life. It's our people's life. It's our family's life. It's our ancestors' life. And if we don't take the time to care, <clears throat> our descendants are going to end up nowhere. And we can't let that happen. We just can't. Yes. Mahalo Nui. Yes, thank you so much, Sarah, for being with me today and sharing your mana'o. Um, it's so enlightening listening to your journey and how, you know, you lived abroad. And now I'm so happy to say that you are back home in Hawaii, standing up for our land, our aina, our people. So mahalo, mahalo. And taking care of your kuleana that you're your ohana put on you. So my ka'i, I wish you all the very best, you and your ohana. And regardless where you reside, back in New York or back in Hawaii, you know, I, I'm convinced that that aloha spirit will go with you wherever you are and you are gonna represent Hawaii the best of your ability. So mahalo, mahalo. Thank you, Auntie Maxine. I'm so, I'm, I'm really, glad that I was able to contribute to this. I think that what you're doing is really important, you know, and it's uh -huh. very like dear to my heart, you know, that that you're providing a platform to people to give voice to what's happening to our people, because this is a really critical time for our people, you know, and it, our voices need to be ho'olaha, you know what I mean? I, they need know. to be broadcast big time. <laughs> mahalo, mahalo. <laughs> This has been another episode with HAAP, Hawaii Abroad Audio Podcast. Thank you for being here and listening to Sarah's journey. Join me again as I speak to more Hawaiians as they live abroad from our homeland of Hawaii. I'm Auntie Max, signing off. Aloha!